Good morning, Hillside. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everyone, on this beautiful, hot Sunday in July. <clears throat> Let's open the service in prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being a good God. We thank you for bringing us together in worship this morning uh, to learn your word, to uh, embrace your word, and to take it into the week ahead. Uh, please watch over us this week. Uh, please bring peace down on, on the church, on the community, on the nation this week um, with the incident last night in Pennsylvania. We'd ask that you please pray for, for Trump and his family and for the families of the victims and uh, for everyone involved, no matter what side you're on. Um, it's an unfortunate event, and, uh, and we, pray, we pray for peace, Lord, for our nation, and that you would calm, calm the emotions of people and uh, help us to all remember that it's not all on our shoulders. It's on your shoulders, Lord, and that you have a plan, and that plan is working for good so we can take comfort in that and not be anxious. Please watch over uh, Kevin this morning as he delivers the message. Uh, please open our ears and our eyes to hear and understand your word, Lord, and, uh, and uh, bless us all during this time and in the week ahead. Amen. Our psalm reading this morning is Psalm 145, verses 10 through 13. All your works shall give, us, shall give thanks to you, O Lord. And all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. The kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. Amen. Good morning, church. Welcome this morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord together. In, uh, the Bible says in Psalm 150, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So if you have breath this morning, um, if you can hear my voice, would you please stand with us and let's give God praise for he is worthy of it this morning. Cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause you're 
cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. another to church this morning. Meet somebody new. Shake somebody's hand. Welcome. Like you 
scripture reading comes from Matthew 7 24 through 27 everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the wind blew, and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. If you're willing and able, please stand again. Continue to worship through music and song. This peace that outlasts all this, the hope that's in the blood, this future grace that's mine today, that Jesus Christ has won. Tomorrow's in your hands All I need to ever Just like you, you always have I'm fighting the battle You've already won No matter what comes my
you, Jesus. We thank you that you are here with us. Lord, we ask that you give us more of a desire to seek your face, more of a desire to seek the person of Jesus. Thank you that you hear our cries in the quietness of our hearts, in the stillness of this moment. May we find rest in you. May we find peace in the Prince of Peace lay down our lives before the King of Kings. You are worthy, Lord, of all the honor and all the praise, and we give that to you this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen, church. You may have a seat, and children are dismissed to Sprouts. And I invite Kevin up to bring the word this morning. Give me a second while I set up. Um, and I know last time I kept on punching that. So let me move that. Okay. Well, some of you know I'm a history teacher by profession. I'm not somebody who comes up here. And teaching's a little different than preaching, I gotta be honest. There's, more, there's interaction. And a lot of what I do is play off the interaction of the students, so it's very different when I'm up here. But I've been missing teach, teaching history lately, so I hate to tell you this, because I know even my wife hates history. Today is going to be a lot of history, because I miss it so much. But here's the thing, before you say, well, wait a minute, we're in church service. Well, what are you talking about history? Well, you've got to see, for me, when I look at history, I see the truth of God's word. It doesn't matter if it's church history, Bible history, any history. Because God is sovereign over all. So history is what draws me. I, I can see God's word in action, the truth of it, like a lot of you would see it in nature. Uh, I'm not the type of guy that goes out and just goes, ah, oh, look at what God has created. I just, I'm just not that guy. But I know a lot of you are. You know, you, know, you look at nature and say, wow, I can see the handiwork of God. I know that there was a God who created and I tend to be like, have you ever seen the movie National Lampoon Vacation? Uh, when Clark Griswold went to the Grand Canyon, and he's just like, all right, let's go. And that's me with nature. Now, does anybody know when National Lampoon Vacation came out? 83. 
1983. And have you noticed lately there has been really an uptick of 80s nostalgia? Two years ago, Top Gun Maverick came out, right? Uh, Tom Cruise in a fighter jet once again. And that was a big hit. And just this summer, Beverly Hills Cop 4, basically, or Axel Foley came out um, with Eddie Murphy. And in a couple of days, my favorite is coming back to Netflix, the final season of Cobra Kai. You know, the extension, <laughs> uh, the extension of the Karate Kid story from 1984. When you think of the 80s, what do you think about? You can yell it out, I don't care. I'm a teacher, I'm used to it. Anything? What, big care? Big care. What? Work. Work. I remember like neon, this, this, what? Neon colors. Yeah, um, I, I'm the assistant coach of the softball team, and the girls wanted to wear all pink one day, and they were like, Mr. Cullen, you got to come in in pink tomorrow. And I go, I haven't owned a pink T-shirt since the 80s, because pink was very big in the 80s, even for guys to wear. Now, my high school and college career was encapsulated in the 1980s. I was part of the MTV generation, when MTV actually showed music videos. And there were a lot of great songs in that decade. And if you listen to music of the 80s, I want you to think of songs that had the word heaven in it, or it was part of the lyrics, major part of the lyrics. All right? So think of at least one song with heaven in the lyrics or part of the lyrics. All right? Here are the three I came up with. One is Belinda Carlisle's Heaven on Earth. Oh, baby, do you know what that's worth? Ooh, heaven is a place on earth. Oh, I got to say this before. I forgot to tell you this. I'm going to try not to sing because I don't want to embarrass my family, but they also know that I can't help myself sometimes, as they know from driving the car, that it might just, it might just come out. So the only good thing about that is I'm going to make, if I do start singing, I'm going to make the worship team sound even that much better because... <laughs> because I just can't sing. Okay, so, ooh, baby, do you know what that's worth? Ooh, heaven is a place on earth. They say in heaven, love comes first. We'll make heaven a place on earth. Ooh, heaven is a place on earth. Anybody have that one? All right. How about um, this one? Brian Adams, heaven. Uh, baby, you're all that I want. When you're lying here in my arms, I'm finding it hard to believe we're in heaven. And love is all that I need, and I found it there in your heart. It isn't too hard to see we're in heaven. That was a more popular one, I think. Now, this one, I don't think anybody had, but it's one of my favorite singers from the 80s, Eddie Money, because the song doesn't have heaven in it. It's called Peace in Our Time. Then we're going to break down the walls and build a prison with a stone, because you and I know what love is worth. We're going to build a heaven on earth, running in the wheels of fortune, turning water into wine, going to make love the bottom line, going to find peace in our time. That's the dream, right? Finding peace in our time. Building a heaven on earth. When I look at history, I see people of all cultures, locations, time periods who have the same desire for peace, love, heaven. Some will spend a lot of money trying to build it. Some will spend a lot of time trying to build it. And some are willing to destroy other people's lives in order to fill this inner need of the ultimate happiness or heaven. C.S. Lewis once said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Since the fall of Adam and Eve, we have been trying to fill this longing for perfect peace and perfect love with the stuff of the finite physical world. The problem is, the hole in our soul is a God-shaped one, and the finite can, can never adequately fill the infinite. One of my favorite books is from a guy, a 16th century scientist, mathematician, but he was also a theologian. His name is Blaise Pascal. You might know the Pascal computer language. Uh, it's a book called Ponce. And in it, it's, why I like it is, my ADD, you, you can start anywhere. It's just thoughts. So you can start in the middle of the book and you can get, get a nugget of truth. But here is one of those thoughts he put in there. What else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness, 
of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are. Though none can help, since the infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object. In other words, by God himself. We tend to want the peace of God, the love of God, the power of God, but we don't want God. And that leads us to our scripture for today. Um, If you're going to be using your Bible, it's Genesis 11, 1 through 9, the famous story of the Tower of Babel. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a place in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speak in the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. When I read this as a kid, I always wondered, why would God confuse their language? He basically said it. He said, if they could, you know, they're going to be doing whatever they want to do. Nothing would be impossible for them. If people could work together so well that nothing would be impossible, what's the problem? As I got older... I actually read that some atheists have had the same feeling about this verse, but it was part of their greater attack on God's character. Here's an example I found online. This is from an atheist, so this is not the Bible. The Tower of Babel was perhaps the world's first attempt at a humanist utopia. People banded together to create a common culture under a common language personified in a beautiful tower that served as a beacon of unity. For some reason, this was deeply offensive to God who promptly punished them for their peaceful cohabitation. But splintering the common human lang- by splintering the common human language into many distinct tongues, God removed the possibility of humans ever fully understanding each other, cursing them to scatter in war once again. Why is this author wrong? Well, for many reasons. First, he rejects Jewish tradition, the biblical view of the nature of humanity, and thus misses the context of the story. According to one piece of rabbinic literature on this verse, it says the people said, quote, God has no right to choose the upper world for himself and to leave the lower world to us. Therefore, we will build us a tower with an idol on the top holding a sword so that it may appear as if it intended war with God. The Jewish historian Josephus wrote about the Tower of Babel. Now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham the son of Noah, a bold man and of great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe it to God as if it were through God's means they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which procured their, that happiness. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from fear of God but to bring them into a constant dependent on his, Nimrod's, power. Although neither of these quotes are biblical, it does display that the Jewish belief for the tower it was that it was to be taught as an act of human pride, a defiance by people toward God. Second, as a history teacher, one of the best assurances of the trustworthiness of the Bible for me is how it shines a light on the reality of the sinfulness of humanity. From the Garden of Eden through today, I can see the truth of the serpent's temptation. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. As people have used war and enslavement to coerce their version of what is their good and their evil. 
the author who believed the tower represented a humanist utopia is under the assumption that man is basically good, that this unity of humanity would never be broken. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I'd see it in my own family, in the smallest unit we have in society, a family, we see rifts all the time. Yet, for some reason, when we bring everybody together, there's a belief that we're going to make it all good. How is that? How can that, be the, how can that be true? We don't even see it with four people, let alone hundreds of thousands. The story of the tower is filled with human's pride. Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Throughout history, people have displayed their greatness by building tall structures. I don't go into the city a lot. I don't know if you're like me, but when I do go into the city, if you're like me, you go, you go in occasionally, I still look up in wonder of the skyscrapers. 5,000 years later, we still look with amazement with, at the architectural and engineering achievements of these tall towers. It's impressive, but it doesn't make humans all powerful. The Tower of Babel was built in Shinar, which is the southern part of Mesopotamia in modern-day Iraq. Many believe this could be a ziggurat, but the noted Christian historian, in fact, my advisor at the King's College, the late Howard Voss, stated in his commentary on Genesis, quote, ziggurats evolved in Mesopotamia during the third millennium BC, long after the appearance of languages and dialects in the region. Although assuming a ziggurat would open up so many more illustrations of biblical truths, it may detract my main point today, so in the words of Dr. Voss, we will not be getting into the minutia. Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, that we may make a name for ourselves. Just like the songs I quoted earlier, people want the benefits of heaven, the love, the power, the prestige, the justice, the peace, without the God of heaven. And isn't this the desire of nations today? Again, the serpent said, you will be like God. We want the kingdom of God without God. Think of the most wicked nation you can think of. This is something I tell my students all the time. And, I, and I, I'm not going to say who it is. I, I can guarantee who most of you are thinking. But no wicked nation you can think of, they, it's not like the leader comes out and says, I got an idea. We are going to go down in history as the most wicked nation that ever existed. <laughs> Dr. Evil is a Hollywood trope. They don't do that. What they convince their people of is we have to do this in order to get to the good. We need to enact this death, destruction, persecution to get to good. You are doing something righteous in doing this. As Dr. Voss later says in the commentary of the Tower of Babel, those builders discovered that with their inner oneness of spiritual purpose gone, they had to provide an element of social cement of their own concoction. He quotes another scholar, Harold Steiger, who believed the tower demonstrated the hope of imperialistic expansion, which would lead them to do evil in the name of their good. Let's return to verse 11.6. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Why would God shut down people building heaven on earth? Or as the atheist I quoted earlier questioned, why was God so offended of the world's first attempt at a humanistic utopia? You know, one of the great philosophical questions is, are man, man born basically good or basically evil? And I know the evil part is always strong. So I always say this. The, really, the question is, what's wrong with us? I mean, think about it as humanity. What is wrong with us? We, we all enjoy stories where good triumphs over evil, yet there's always evil around. So if we value good so much, why do we often choose the opposite? The Bi Bible is clear. We are born sinful. Think of it this way. My parents never needed to teach me how to lie. I was quite good at it on my own. What they had to teach me was, it's not good to lie. Each one of us needs a change of heart. 
The, the atheists that I talked about would believe, with many others, including some theists, that we are born basically good, that it's societies, institutions, and ideologies that bring evil. People don't need to change. The institutions and the ideologies do. Let's be honest. The atheist here doesn't believe in God and most likely doesn't believe this story ever happened in the first place. However, what he believes is that the Judeo-Christian quote-unquote myth has prevented a humanistic utopia. And since that is preventing the humanistic utopia, the Judeo-Christianity must go. That's how humanity's goodness will come out. But let's look at these verses through the biblical view of humanity's sinfulness. And when we do, I believe we see the confusion of the languages as an act of God's mercy as well as judgment. In the King James, the verse is translated like this. And the Lord said, Behold, the people are one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. You don't need to be restrained from doing good. You need to be restrained from doing evil. Based on God's character and man's sinfulness displayed throughout the Bible, I would be more inclined to believe that confusing of the languages was an act of God's mercy. That such a united force of people would bring death and destruction on an unprecedented scale. In the previous verses, we, you know, in the previous verses in Genesis, we read, Cain killed Abel over jealousy. God brought the flood because every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. So, up until this point in Genesis, man's track record for living rebellion-free wasn't too good. The Tower of Babel is humanity's first attempt at nation building. And from the start, we sought to elevate ourselves over God. So how are we doing today? How can we achieve this heaven on earth? Like the atheist writer I quoted, there are people who believe that traditional institutions, beliefs, and the power they hold are the chains that the French philosopher Rousseau said were preventing us from letting out the goodness within each one of us. They are the source of the corruption, the traditional views, and must be changed or abolished. They call to reject the past and tear it all down and build a brand new tower, more aligned to peace, love, and understanding. Have you ever watched the news lately and heard a call for systemic change that are contrary to our views of traditional beliefs in areas like policing, gender, language, and education? Why as Christians do we bristle against these challenges to the traditional approach? Because as Christians, we lean on the timeless wisdom and authority of a timeless and righteous God. History is filled with the horrors of this tear it all down approach. The Cultural Revolution of Mao's China wanted to eliminate the four olds, old culture, old customs, old ideas, and old habits and it is estimated one to two million people died and between 10 to 20 million people imprisoned. The killing fields in Cambodia in the 1970s wanted also to get rid of the country's past and the government was responsible for killing three million people in four years. Cambodia started with 10 million people. That means the go their government, in order to get rid of the past, killed 30% of their population. Or how about the French Revolution? where Notre Dame was stripped of its Catholicism and became the cathedral to the goddess of wisdom, Sophia. The biblical model of the six-day work week and the one day of rest was replaced by a 10-day work week, nine day of work, one day of rest, in the hope of more productivity. And to protect the people from the evils of the past, the Committee of Public Safety was established. And what occurred? Production actually went down. It wasn't just people that couldn't keep up with a nine day of work, one day of rest a week. The animals couldn't do it either. It seemed like someone designed us for seven, a seven day week. Funny that. And that Committee on Public Safety discovered that the best method to teach the people to dismiss their thoughts of the monarchy and religion was to send suspected sympathizers to the guillotine. So in a true example of Orwellian doublespeak, the reign of terror was for the people's safety. Reform is one thing. Humanity thinking we can start over and build a new garden of Eden without God is the epitome of human arrogance. What's the solution? Well, some place their trust in the government. If we only elect the right leaders, place the right people on the Supreme Court, pass the right laws, then everything will be perfect. Will it? 
as Christians, is the government our ultimate hope? Chuck Colson asked something similar. Now, for those of you who don't know who Chuck Colson is, he was an attorney who worked for the most powerful man in the world in the late 60s and 70s, President Richard Nixon. Colson was known as Nixon's hatchet man. If you wanted a dirty trick done, you went to Chuck Colson. If anyone knew the power that the United States had and how to wield it for good or evil, it was Chuck Colson. Well, he got wrapped up in the Watergate scandal, was sent to prison, and gave his first allegiance to Jesus Christ. Knowing full well the intoxication of government and the ease of corruption within, he reminds us, in a quote I'm about to show, not to put our ultimate trust in our nation's leaders. He stated this, Where is the hope? I meet millions who tell me they feel demoralized by the decay around us. Where is the hope? The hope that each of us have is not in who governs us or what laws are passed or what great things we do as a nation. Our hope is in the power of God working through the hearts of people. And that's where our hope is in this country. That's where our hope is in life. Our hope is in the power of God working through the hearts of people. And that's where our hope is in this country. That's where our hope is in life. It's tempting to think that with all our technological advances, our military might, our wealth, that our government is the source of all our answers. But listen to the words of God through the prophet Jeremiah. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. And if you're wondering where your hope is, reflect on your reaction the next time a politician you wanted to win loses or the outcome of vote on a law that doesn't go your way. Yes, we should fulfill our civic duty. But ultimately, do we act like the government is in control or God is in control? Where is our hope? As Peter states in his first epistle, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors, as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor." Early Christians were known for their acts of charity. They were known for, if a child was unwanted, typically it was a female, they would leave it exposed in the woods, and Christians would hear about this, and they'd go into the woods and take the baby and raise it. They were known for that. Some even served loyally in the Roman legions. Yet many were also in prison, tortured, or even put to death for their faith in Jesus. In a defense of Christianity, the early church father, Justin Martyr, wrote this to the emperor. And everywhere we, more readily than all men, endeavor to pay to those appointed by you the taxes, both ordinary and extraordinary, as we have been taught by him. For at that time, some came to him and asked him if one ought to pay tribute to Caesar. And he answered, tell me, whose image does the coin bear? And they said, Caesar's. And again he answered them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Whence to God alone we render worship, but in other things we gladly serve you acknowledging you as kings and rulers of men, and praying that with your kingly power you be found to possess also sound judgment. But if you pay no regard to our prayers and frank explanations, we shall suffer no loss, since we believe, or rather indeed are persuaded, that every man will suffer punishment and eternal fire according to the merit of his deed, and will render account according to the power he has received from God, as Christ showed when he said, to whom God has given more of him shall be required." Not only is Justin saying Christians are taught in their faith to be loyal to Caesar, Justin was confident that if the emperor was acting unjustly, if he was persecuting Christians not for actual crimes they committed, but solely because they have placed their faith in Jesus, that the emperor, yeah, you're right, he'll never face judgment in the Roman Empire. But Justin, just Justin knew he was going to be facing judgment in God's empire. And despite showing this respect and honor to the emperor, 
Christians were still persecuted by the empire. And what this history teaches about all this, that people in the Roman Empire began wondering what Christians had that they didn't. What was the source of their peace and love even in the midst of persecutions? Christians living out their faith in the living God help draw people to Christ. In terms of the physical realm, we are citizens of the United States. But our citizenship in heaven doesn't begin at a future date. While we reside in this physical kingdom, we also have our citizenship in heaven. As Paul says in Philippians 3, Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, present tense. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform, future tense, will transform, our lowly body to be like his glorious body. It is, it's like we're working on a work visa here on, on earth. So we have our citizenship in heaven, like dual citizenship, Right? Years ago, when I was um, teaching, I had this brother and sister. Their parents were here. They worked, I think they worked for a pharmaceutical company. They're here from Great Britain. They were here since elementary school. I think the sister was two years older. Did any, either one of them speak with a British accent? Makes sense that they did, right? And you would, you would think it was the older sister that would speak with the British accent because she probably lived in England a little longer than her brother. But it wasn't. The older sister, you would have never known that her parents were from the UK. She acted like an American. She spoke like an American. No sign of a British accent. I got her brother two years later. He had one of the heaviest British accents I ever heard. Didn't even seem like it was his sister. They were like related. So I asked the older sister, what's the deal? Why don't you have a British accent? And he does. And what she said is, when he goes home, he doesn't, you know, here he is, he's in the United States, and he's doing things American kids do. But when he goes home, he watches, Brit he watches the BBC. He watches news, he watches cultural things, because he wants to keep up with his Britishness. In fact, she says, he works on making sure he retains his British accent. And as, if, and as we live in the physical world, are we displaying that same effort? Are we showing our citizenship in heaven as proudly as this young man did in his citizenship in the United Kingdom? Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Do people know your political, our political standing more than our standing with Jesus? Are we known for our love for others, our caring for people in need? Are we taking time to know our God in prayer and Bible reading? Do we give a reason for the hope we have in Christ? What does our life say about our citizenship? The kingdom of God isn't a future event. We should realize that every time we say the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth here as it is in heaven there. When we do the will of God, here is the evidence of our citizenship there. The kingdom arrived with Jesus, as he said in Mark. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And he gives us the requirement for citizenship in heaven. Repent, turn from your sin that has separated you from God. Turn from, Excuse me. Turn from handling things the way you feel is best and turn to what God says is good. And that means when it comes to relationships, finances, sexuality, leadership, the workplace, everything. God knows we are sinners. He doesn't want to keep us as sinners. He sent Jesus to take our punishment for our sins and give us citizenship in heaven. That's the good news of the gospel. We all have this desire for perfect love, perfect peace, perfect happiness. And we try to build a tower to reach the perfect infinite realm. The greater it looks, the longer it will last, we think. But eventually, it goes the way of Ozymandias in the Percy Shelley poem. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert near them on the sand. 
have sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare. The lone and level sands stretch far away. Are you struggling to fill the infinite void, the infinite desire with the things in the infinite world? Let me tell you of an everlasting tower that connects this world to heaven. Jesus fulfilled the dreams of the builders of the Tower of Babel, but not in the way they were thinking. The people wanted to build the tower to make a name for themselves. Jesus wanted God the Father's name glorified, and we are called to pray in the name of Jesus. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. The people wanted a tower so they wouldn't be scattered, and instead they were scattered. Jesus regathers people. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people, all people to myself. The tower builders thought they could use the finite resources of brick and mortar in a vain attempt to pierce a hole from the lower story into the upper story. By the figurative storming of heaven, their leaders would declare that they know the mind of God to manipulate and enslave the people to do their will. But since Jesus is fully God and fully man, he is the only one that can, can, that can connect the two worlds, the upper and the lower stories. He is the tower that leads us, finite humans, to the infinite heaven of God's country. Because only a perfect being can fulfill our desire for perfect love, perfect peace, and perfect happiness. Only a perfect, infinite being can lead us to heaven. In the words of one last song, from Stevis Curtis Chapman, it's another old one, Heaven in the World World. It happened one night with a tiny baby's birth. God of creation crying, he sent heaven to earth. He, Jesus, is the hope. He is the peace that will make this life complete for every man, woman, boy, and girl looking for heaven in the real world. And one last Bible verse, Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That is our hope. Let's pray. Dear Lord, in a world that sometimes we think we have it all under control or look for things in this world to keep things under control, looking for that per perfect love and peace, we know it can only be found in you. Continue to direct our hearts in that direction on our path to heaven. Help us to show our citizenship to you in this world and our hope for the world to come. In your name we pray, amen. time we receive our morning tithes and offerings and if you're new or visiting please don't feel obliged to give we're just we're glad you're here we're grateful that you're here and we're gonna sing a song together
for the offering. Dear Lord, we know that everything that we have comes through your hand, uh, everything that you've given us in our life and that you've promised us that you'll provide for our needs. You know what we need better than we do, and uh, you promised that you'd, you'd, have, that you'd provide that for us, so let us take comfort in that. Please accept this morning the small amount of gifts that we give back uh, as a token of our faith in you, Lord, and uh, Please give us wisdom and discernment as the church decides uh, the best way to use these to support the mission of the church and, and well, most importantly, your will and the expansion of your kingdom, Lord. In these things we pray, amen. And maybe you've joined me really quick in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us these things, our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you for worshiping with us today. It was great to see everyone. Uh, a few quick announcements before our benediction. Uh, visitors, if you're with us today, great to see you. We'd like to get to know you better. So uh, if you have a few minutes, come talk to us at the Welcome Center. We can uh, get you signed up for our newsletter so you know what's going on at the church. And, uh, and we can get you uh, involved and find out what you're interested in. We have ministries of all types for families, for women, for men, for everybody. So uh, great. Would, thanks for being here and would like to get to know you better. VBS is coming up, uh, first week of first full week of August. Still need volunteers, uh, so if anybody's feeling a tug there, talk to Sabrina, uh, talk to us at the Welcome Center, and we uh, can get you involved. Renew is on their summertime schedule, so the women's uh, ministry that typically meets on Wednesday mornings throughout the year, throughout the summer months, they're meeting once once a month, and this Wednesday is the meeting for July, so 10 a.m here in the fireside room on Wednesday. Children's ministry, Hillside Kids Children's Ministry is also on summer schedule. And uh, every two weeks we have family fun in the park, which is at Flanders Park uh, behind the Weiss supermarket over in Flanders. This Wednesday we're gonna be meeting at six o'clock. So six to 7.30, just come, come as a family, come with the kids. And uh, there's no, it's, it's pretty casual, but we just hang out and have some fellowship time together. And just a reminder that in our newsletter, there's still links for signups for our two military families where the husbands are deployed. Uh, so if you'd like to do something nice for fellow uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, and for these military families, you can cook a meal uh, for one of them. I know they appreciate it. They have a lot going on with little kiddos and stuff. So. And with that, if you'd please rise for the benediction. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in, G in Christ Jesus. Go in peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sing your perfect law exposes me. Too sad.